Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 660 of them now. Um, in fact, <laughs> today's interview is number 666, and someone was saying, ooh, who's going to get that number? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that number has significance, if, as some of you may be aware, but, uh, but believe me, that these implications of that number have are a far cry from the qualities of today's guest. <laughs> anyway, today's guest is, uh, oh, so let me finish what I was saying. So I've done a great many of them and hopefully will continue. Um, and uh, this whole program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website and also a page that explains alternatives to PayPal. So my lucky guest for number 666 is Anne Mathy. <laughs> um, Anne has been practicing yoga and meditation for a couple of decades and has completed her master's in the traditions of yoga and meditation from SOAS University, which is a school of Oriental and African studies in London with ongoing Sanskrit training. And was inspired from an early age by her father's anecdotal experiences with Kundalini, which we're going to be talking a, a, a lot about today. Um, her own experiences have pointed her towards a phenomenological investigation of the parallels between spontaneous Kundalini awakenings and Buddhist paths to enlightenment. Uh, her previous previous research focuses on the phenomenology of Buddhist and yogic experiences through practice. Anne is currently researching spontaneous kundalini arousals and how these experiences map onto the path of realization within Indian, Buddhist, and yogic traditions, as well as cutting-edge consciousness theory. Her mission is to gain a deeper understanding of the psychological processes that can arise from spontaneous transpersonal experiences or deep meditation practice, and how we can safely support others walking this path toward greater wholeness. Um, just about every week I get contacted by somebody who feels they're going through some kind of kundalini awakening and it's usually unpleasant for them and they, they need help. Um, so it's an important area. It seems to be widespread. Anne and I were chatting a few minutes ago and she says she gets contacted all the time by people like that too. So I think there needs to be a, a much more um, well-known support structure for people who are going through this stuff and also perhaps <clears throat> greater knowledge um some of it cautionary about um the trouble you can get yourself into if you uh, awaken kundalini prematurely or in some unnatural way so those are some of the points we'll be talking about and Anne sent me a really nice outline of points that she'd like to discuss so we're kind of going through that we're going to go through that but we'll also deviate uh according to the questions you may send in or according to any other thoughts that come to mind as we as we talk. Okay, so let's start in by just having you tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, you know, what kind of experiences you might have had from your spiritual practice, which inspired you to focus so much on this kind of thing, and anything else you'd like to tell us. Sure, okay. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll start with... Um... My introduction to it was really from my father from a really young age, about five. He used to sit me down and just for five hours on a Saturday and talk about theosophy. Five hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I loved it. I absolutely wow. loved it. I mean, I would just be like gripped listening with intent. And he went through um, a, a really intense experience in the 60s when he was uh, he's from Glasgow. He went to Japan to train in martial arts when he was much younger and um, had a very profound, a very strong Kundalini experience, which he couldn't control. Um, and so that took him on, on a journey with Kundalini. He was working um, with a psychiatrist initially, and the psychiatrist advised him to go and see this Zen monk who was also um, a scientist who was studying the Kundalini experience. So him, along with a few other people, were kind of being experimented on or uh, they were exploring this from a scientific perspective with a, a, doc a Dr. Motoyama was his name. 
So he really, um, he had no idea what was happening when it was happening. Um, he really struggled through this process and um, kind of studied it afterwards. So it was, a, it was an afterthought, his research, his um, looking into it. And so he really looked at it from the kind of uh, theosophical perspective. So they would see the Kundalini experience, they would talk about it as initiation, as initiation of fire. So when I was younger, he would talk to me about it in full blown detail, the, the kind of uh, scary bits and the fascinating, beautiful bits as well. And I remember just listening like, wow, this is amazing. Um, yeah, completely fascinated by it. And I, I guess that's always been um, there in the back of my mind as a teenager growing up. It was always kind of there, but I got on with my life. And then a similar thing happened to me in my 20s. Um, fortunately, having had had the backstory, having had sort of been taught a bit about it, I kind of knew what was coming and took myself away from the judgmental eye or the white coats oh. <laughs> and, um, and took myself to India and hitchhiking and took myself to places where I knew that it would be okay to, you know, go through the process without hindrance or without judgment or without, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's a safe place. I knew I needed a safe place. So, so yeah, that was really kind of in my 20s. And since then, the, the process is sort of, I guess, making sense of it, calming down, um, realigning myself to practice, um, grounding myself in the real world, you know, paying the bills, raising a child, <laughs> like that kind of thing. So, yeah, integrating those two worlds has been my um, work, I suppose, at the same time, research, bringing it to mainstream, bringing this phenomena to the mainstream Western world so that it doesn't get confused with mania or psychosis or, um, you know, some other kind of pathology, which I which is not, you know, I mean, I think some things can arise in the psychology, which can present as psychopathy, but I mean, it's such a different process. So, so yeah, that's my mission. Um, how can we bring this into the Western world? How can we further this with science and spirituality? I think that's one of the topics we're going to talk about today is the distinction um, between psychosis and sp uh, spiritual experience. And perhaps one of the things we'll, we'll throw in there is the tendency of intense spiritual practice to trigger an actual psychosis, um, which it can. Um, what was it? The, uh, some quote from somebody, I don't know who said this, but it was something like the mystic swims in waters in which the um, madman drowns or something like that. Uh, yeah. In other yeah. Words, you're, and you're, there's a fine line between yeah, the there can the madman as well. Yeah. I've gotten a little kooky myself at times over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Still am. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of modern psychiatry and what we deem as wellness or sane, I mean, and I would question some of the things that we consider sane in mainstream society, you know, there's a lot of um, very unhealthy, say, sane practices that people go through their lives on, you know, and it's only until they reach their deathbed that they sit in regret having followed those paths. So I think, you know, when we look at um, the wellness model and what it is to be happy, and healthy these um and then you look at the the spiritual awakening process they're, they're quite different i think in terms of how the psychology changes of what we're doing to our psychology on these two things yeah it seems like a lot of the things that are considered sane are just um ordinary and therefore customary um but in a really sane society they would seem abnormal or you know um subnormal or something yeah yeah or even certain i mean i think that was the thing for me i remember um a trigger for um the the process i suppose or my my um in my 20s when i really started to explore this stuff deeply uh, i did a sociology degree and i just remember uh, on, in grad you know doing my dissertation at the end and just thinking oh my god this is all this is all just constructs this none of this is real <laughs> this is all theory fabricated and pulled together and we're told to live under these constructs which you know there's a reason for them obviously we need we need some order in the chaos of course but um 
yeah, I mean, I wonder how many of these constructs are are, are helpful or a hindrance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you started some kind of Buddhist practice in your 20s or even sooner since you were exposed at the age of five to a lot of this stuff? Yeah, I was doing a bit of yoga. To, uh, I was trying lots of different yoga, but none of it was really that helpful. I think through the process, um, I just had to sort of let go to the process. I was doing, I was experimenting with all different types of yoga practices and I found them to really exacerbate the issue like heightened emotional sensitivity or kind of um, take me into worlds that I didn't understand and couldn't navigate. Um, so after a while, I just stopped doing practices um, and just let the thing unfold. So something was unfolding even without practices. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Completely. Yeah. 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 It was. What it was, was that? You mean it's some kind of Kundalini awakening? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was a um, yeah. That took a couple of years to kind of work its way through. So that was when I had to sort of take myself out of society and go to <laughs> India. Yeah. 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 Um, and. Uh, and I think, yeah, so I try, you know, I really try to do some of these different practices during that time. And I found that they were actually, yeah, not very helpful, um, quite uncomfortable. And then eventually I kind of came around to um, practices based on the yoga sutras, which kind of um, aligned a lot more with um, calm, relaxed postures, nothing intense, nothing crazy, nothing, you know, no kumbhakas or like strong pranayama practices and that was really amazing along with the moral path the yamas niyama that i found really really helpful just following the sutras working through the sutras making sure that i was um pulling my concentration together working through any knots in my body and really kind of looking at my trauma properly <laughs> so um but yeah I, I suppose that was happening alongside buddhist practice so for me the buddhist practice came along and it was a real literal godsend i remember um i think part of this process as well is it, it does bring up a lot of um subconscious psychological trauma comes to the surface so i think there was a lot of like anxiety or depression arising as well. So the Buddhist Vipassana was, I mean, incredible just to kind of know, oh my God, there's actually a way out of suffering. Like it does what it says on the tin, you know, like it, <laughs> like it's, it totally works. So for me, yeah, finding the Vipassana and um, concentration practices, it wasn't so much about I'm going to get enlightened and or anything like that. It was like, oh my God, I need to get out of this psychological hell that I'm in. So for me, these techniques were um, a lifeline. And then I, I, later on, you know, I suppose you kind of like delve deeper and then start to experience or understand a little bit more about what these practices are actually doing psychologically or spiritually. Well, there's several good points in there I'd like to discuss more with you. Um... Firstly, so you you were you know they <laughs> there's all these funny words like a Hindu or a a, a, a boob <laughs> all these names that people make up to you know about the blends of different traditions. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's one. So you were kind of a a Hindu or something. <laughs> I guess. I mean, you know, I think interestingly, these two texts really. Um, work beautifully together the the yoga sutras and buddhism there's a lot there's a in the sutras there's quite a few nods to buddhism yeah in the text yeah. like they're really really compatible but yeah i mean okay so if i was to describe myself in terms of what practice or or, or path would i adhere to like my inner world is tantric my practical practice path is theravada buddhist my uh, world view is Mahayanan. Um, my heart is Vedanta. So, <laughs> you <laughs> know, if I, it, it's, it's, um, I, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not dogmatic. I've found that these, these teachings have just really helped my actual life, you know, so I've never had a teacher. I've never had a, um, a I'm not a part of a lineage. So for me, it's been, um, these texts have guided me 
And I think I've probably always been a bit wary of teachers as well. I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I, I've kind of felt um, wary is the word, but I've never found someone like I've met people with Sidi who have done things to my brain, but I've seen their humanness as well. And what I've needed guidance in is walking the human path. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. You know, there's that saying that we should dig one deep well rather than 10 shallow wells. But I, oh, another way of putting it might be that we can use 10 different tools to dig one deep well. Uh, and some people manage to cobble together a really effective procedure, you know, life or spiritual sadhana out of, you know, picking and choosing amongst the, the best of various traditions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really, no, because I, I used to feel, right, and my dad would always say to me, just stick to one, do it properly. Right. But, um, you know, so when you look at the tradition, it's like more than 2000 years of evolution, of revolution in different traditions branching off. It's a really, it's so complex, you know, like when you say Vedanta, or when you say Buddhist, or when you say Tantric, all of these things sort of lay over each other. And there are threads that kind of move through these traditions, which all link up. So ultimately, we're talking about something human and natural and real and these traditions are just concepts and constructs built around the natural real human experience that is the potential you know and enlightenment so for me i think that um i i i mean okay so my in my heart i suppose i'm buddhist like that though my roots dharma and my roots that's what i always come back to that's what i always feel is um you know solid like i love the sutras because they're so pragmatic the texts are just you know the instructions are right there it's like follow the instructions and 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 it, it works i liked what you were saying about um when you were talking about the yoga sutras about the ethical um dimension of it um and really i think that you find that at the foundation of every tradition and certainly there in buddhism as as you well know and it's often overlooked these days, and especially like when you're talking about teachers and how you've never actually had one. Um, in a way, it's a bit of a minefield having mm. finding a teacher because so many yeah. of them have been ethically compromised, um, yeah. even though they might have something to offer and some eloquence and even some shakti and you know so a presence. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? We we're complex. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I. I was going to tell you this earlier, but um, along with a few friends, I helped to found an organization called the Association for Spiritual Integrity, um, oh. <clears throat> which I'll, I'll send you a link to later. But um, based upon our experience with, you know, all these ethical violations that take place in contemporary spirituality and the the hurt and disillusionment that it causes people. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it, this organ, I, I won't go into it at great length right now, but um, it is a, an essential component of the yoga sutras, as you mentioned, the yamas and niyamas, and um, and basically every other tradition. Maybe you could elaborate on why you think that it's important. Oh yeah, I mean that's huge, isn't it? I think um, um, I think that's the central tenant of all practice like we are our worst we're our own worst uh, enemy aren't we when it comes to suffering <laughs> so many times you know when you honestly reflect on your own decisions and your own choices if you really really honestly reflect on yourself then you can see where stuff went wrong <laughs> like you know and a lot of that is from ignorance as well or not having the clarity in that moment to make a wise decision but but yeah, I mean, I think we have to, we have to, we have to start with that. Like it's, um, I think if we want to cultivate, uh, for me, I think, you know, one sure way to know that you're developing on a spiritual path is that if you become more compassionate, more empathic and more forgiving, but I think that in, that in itself is one sure way to know that you're walking um, a, a good path. And, I think that that comes about through moral behavior, you know, so by looking at the way that you interact with people, the way or really reflecting on how you make people feel, that's going to um, evolve your heart, um, allow for greater sensitivity. And not only that, I think when you sit and meditate, 
those things come up. So you can't really go into deep kind of samadhi states when you've got certain hindrances that are rising in your brain. When your conscience is clear, it's really easy to slip into deep concentration states it's much easier you know so the so the moral path kind of really helps in that but i mean that would be for a selfish intention for a more um altruistic means that that is the intention like the whole intention to <laughs> for the benefit of others you know and i think it's not just a psychological thing i mean you can talk about um you can tell us more about the subtle body and how the subtle body can become a repository for all kinds of Gunk, oh yeah gunk that really um impedes the re clear reflection of pure consciousness um yeah totally. and, and how I mean, the spiritual God. path in one sense could be seen as a a purification of the subtle body yeah yeah that's that's huge i mean that is the kind of like when you look at sankhya philosophy and the gunas i've heard you talk about the gunas before in, in other interviews um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a major theme in Tantra in, it's a major theme in yoga. When you look at, um, the nature of thought and, uh, it, okay. So, so we're talking about thought as if it's a substance, but in these philosophies, thought is a kind of vibratory substance and it has context, content, texture to it. And when you act behave think in a certain way this is what you're producing this is what's moving through your system and, and it is i mean this is huge in buddhism as well that kind of like mind body connection when you think a certain way that's what's like getting lodged in your body and you can feel it like knots in your back or a headache or tension in your muscles you know that's um that's the mind contracting and the body responding to that like so these these are a reflection of the type of thought. So a kind of a sattvic thought, a more lighter um, thought would have a clear effervescent quality to it, an expansion or a, um, a, a clarity, a lightness, you know, like a moral thought will have those qualities. Whereas sort of selfish thoughts tend to get sticky and tend to have a gravity towards them, um, which ultimately does harm actual physical pain, you know. so. Yeah. Um, speaking of the gunas, perhaps you can comment on how um, you know, a more sattvic makeup is more, it's more translucent, it's more conducive to realization than a, a rajasic or a tamasic makeup. Maybe you can define those terms and yeah, elaborate yeah. on that. Yeah. So like, okay, so you're talking about prakriti, like shakti, like the, the nature of reality, this, this matrix that we live in, this kind of... Um, um, the, the illusion that we're living in, the illusion that we have to navigate our way through, the illusion that we have to work with until we are genuinely enlightened bodhisattvas, we still need to navigate our, th our way through this uh, stuff, beingness. And um, yeah, that they come, the, 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 how would you say, the fundamental nature can be broken down into these three components, uh, rajasic, sattvic tamasic so rajasic has this sort of vibrant energy to it we need it because it excites us and it activates us and it fires us up and it creates reaction and interaction so we need rajas but too much of it you know can make you angry or agitated or um distracted um sattvic is the thing that holds structure so it'd be like imagine um the a snowflake and its beautiful crystalline structure, that would be sattvic. So something uh, pure, uh, it's held, supported, and light and balanced. Um, and then tamas is the thing that makes things solid and real, uh, brings everything into form. So we need all of these energies interacting with each other all the time to create this illusion that we live in. But what happens, the nature of the mind is that it continues to unfold and we um, get drawn to uh, the materiality of the world through our senses. So, and that becomes tamasic because we have layers of thought that just build up upon each other and like these constructs that become real and that becomes tamasic, that becomes heavy in your heart and in your mind. That's where depression can happen that's where anxiety starts to happen so these thoughts just become so real that's the tamas you can overcome that 
by cultivating sattvic minds like so the food that you eat if it's like alive that's sattvic so if a fresh apple for instance that would be a sattvic food um behavior speech you know keeping clean like all of that stuff is sattvic it's all the words that you say you know the, are your words kind are they helpful are they support all of that all of that stuff is sattvic so when you do that you're like having a spiritual bath you know <laughs> this is like this is your your um your should be your daily hygiene psychological <laughs> clean yeah and not only foods but other substances i mean consuming alcohol for instance is tamasic and uh, yeah 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 certain, certain drugs are rajasic and so on if you took yeah. some kind of amphetamines or something that's very rajasic um, and all these things impair the nervous system's ability to be the temple of the soul as jesus put it yeah and do you know and that's you know it's interesting you bring that up actually because there's a um skillful way to work these forces so sometimes you might need a bit of tamas and you might need a bit of rajas in your system but it again you know we have to be really skillful so i, I mean it, okay ultimately if we're trying to get ourselves out of suffering if you're in deep if you're like just like heavy with thought or the weight of the world is really on your shoulders i mean I, how can you not get through how can you get through life without that happening at least once do you know and I, that's why the text, the path, they always say, just do everything sattvic, <laughs> just get yourself out of the muck. And then once you feel that lightness come in and then we can sort of start to navigate skillfully through these different um, elements. I mean, you know, sometimes um, we are flesh and blood as well. And I think it's, uh, we do need a bit of the tamas and a bit of the rajas, but yeah, in a skillful oh, yeah. way, it's difficult yeah, to, to In know. a balance. <laughs> Um, I remember hearing a story, I don't know if this is even a true story, but there was some yogi in, in Rishikesh or someplace, and he was just, you know, gung-ho, living this really sattvic lifestyle, pedal to the metal, but he just wasn't having any spiritual breakthroughs or good experiences. And one day he got bit by a scorpion. And it was like, and after that, he started having these great experiences. And the, the oh. explanation to the story was he needed a little bit of poison in his system. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god wow that's an awesome story wow yeah that's quite full on i mean you got to hear stuff like that happening yeah. in <laughs> India a lot. yeah well yeah definitely i mean that's and that's that's you know what they've discovered when they um research people who i i suppose through a kind of um there's been a lot of research recently in kundalini experiences and what they've noticed is that a lot of this stuff can happen through trauma as well so like a a breakthrough or a kund spontaneous kundalini experience can happen as a result of some big trauma you know and it's like yeah i mean I, it's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating thing like what is that trigger there that causes that huge spiritual combustion to happen within oneself do you have any comments whatsoever on the agoris who who you know consume all this t really tamasic <laughs> stuff intentionally i think they're just trying to yeah. freak people out i don't know if they make any progress with know. it but... i don't know i don't i've i met a few in india but then you know you meet a lot of babas in india and you never really know if if they're like for We're, real yeah. or, right. or if they're just doing it for the tourists i <laughs> think the, no, definitely, yeah. I used to, yeah i mean i used to go up to um uh, up in the himalayas when you go on certain pilgrimages then you, you do see a lot of genuine bubbles and they stay away from the touristy areas you see right. um but but the agori there's quite a few in varanasi so varanasi is where they where the burning gats are right so um that it's not yeah see that's an interesting one the 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 intention behind those practices are to um overcome um psychological rigidity or you know when you've been so institutionalized and so kind of controlled and conformed and molded into a certain path that that life is just like stuck you know or a belief system becomes so dogmatic so the agori were like the rebels they were breaking through all of the traditions because a brahmanical a brahmanical world is very pure like no alcohol no meat no women whilst they were menstruating you know what i mean tradition you know it's quite very traditionally very pure in the sattvic means we were talking about so the agoris were like this isn't spiritual awakening you know and they would rebel that was their the meat eating the alcohol drinking the um 
sex, all of those things. That's one kind of aspect of it. But um, yeah, could have just been a rationalization for doing all the stuff they wanted to do. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to do what I want. Yeah, <laughs> that's always there. Yeah. And yeah. how about the how about the sadhus who you know sit around smoking ganga? Do you, do you think that there's? I, I remember talking to someone years ago who spent some time with them and. Um, and in India, and she felt like 99% of them are just stoners, and, and there's not a lot of spiritual mm. progress mm. taking place there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I mean think, to uh, make you comment on things you don't no, know. No, no, I mean, I, I think I do. I've thought about this a lot, you know, and I think that you like certainly I did as well. Like, you go to India, you go to the Himalayas, and there's a romantic idea there, you know, a delusional idea of, of this. This it is an amazing place, it is seeped with spirituality and mystery and incredible beauty you know but at the same time human beings are human beings i think uh, you know even great spiritual teachers have a bit of desire a bit of hate or a bit of fear still lingering until you're an arhant which is why i'm fascinated with the buddhist path because it really does look at well how do you get rid of all of that stuff all of that you know yeah Let's talk about some of the Buddhist stuff, because this is how you start the notes that you sent me. Um, you know, um, and we we can we don't want to elaborate too much on things such that we don't have time to talk about other things, but maybe we should skim through some of this. Um, like you just used the word arhat, so we'll want to define that. And you you showed me the terms uh, samatha and vipassana and neurodharma. And then the question, what is enlightenment in Buddhism and what are the practices that lead to it? So um, let's start on some of those things. Yeah, okay. All right, so Arahant. What's an Arahant? Should we yeah, choose sure. all about that? And, okay. and there are a number of other terms you threw in there. Stream enter, once returner, non-returner, and the Arahant. So yeah, uh, what yeah. are all these classifications? Yeah, like, okay, so the, re the reason... Okay, so I'm really fascinated by this because now we live in a world where there's a lot of spiritual teachers. There's a lot of... Um, um, you, you know things like gurus and self-proclaimed enlightened people and all of that so my interest is well what exactly is an enlightened person like can you measure it can you tell um wh when someone is is there a how do we how do we know i mean is someone so people have full-on experiences all the time people have very deep spiritual experiences through meditation all the time th th these are becoming more and more common because practice is becoming more and more common um but my question is so what is the what is the psychological transformation that actually does happen once you've been practicing for long enough or the experience lasts for long enough for that real transformation to happen so yeah so i mean in the buddhist context an arahant is someone who um where there is no more hate no more desire no more aversion no more fear no more doubt to ever arise in the mind ever again, no matter what. So it's complete cessation of psychological suffering. Pain is still there. Physical pain is still there. Um, but there's no psychological reaction to that pain. So this is like what a Buddhist would call an arahant. This is, um, I mean, in the Indian tradition, it would be someone who is not going to get born again, because it's that very thought process that makes you become born again right and so all the things you just mentioned are outer symptoms that they, they, they don't really describe the subjective experience the person is having but you know what you're saying is that it, whatever his objective his subjective yeah. experience is um for it to be genuine there would have to be an absence of hate and all the other you know negative yes. things you mentioned and if and if those things are still there you can deduce that the inner experience is not yet mature yeah Absolutely. I mean, that's a full blown arahant. Like they're rare, but in the Buddhist path, there's four stages to get there. So, so each of those hindrances, each of those psychological things, will fall away one by one. There's an order that they fall away in as well, and they fall away according to a certain depth of meditative practice that you've come across. So, and that that they fall away when you have seen a certain depth of the mind through practice. And that, I mean, to me, that's um, fascinating you know like there's a lot of teachers out there who have siddhi like like powers charisma whatever all of that but still those things are working now you know still the selfish or the the hate or the anger or whatever that's still happening in them um 
And that's fine. That's normal. <laughs> it's very difficult to get to an arahant, um, you know. Well, it's normal, but if they purport to be something, right, super yeah. normal, then there's a problem. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and usually they those people don't really talk about becoming an arahant. It's just not. I mean, well, within the tradition, anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good sign. I mean, definitely, loads of people don't have very much anger. I mean, they're not, you could put them in, or that you'd see them in a situation where you'd think you should be furious, but they're not at all. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're, they're genuinely uh, calm, of, their heart is calm, peaceful. So, uh, you know, that, that's a good indicator, I think. What about people who are, you know, alleged to be enlightened? Sometimes this includes famous gurus who have a reputation for getting really angry at people um, and you know yeah. scold, scolding and yelling at them and and yeah. stuff like that. Um, Interesting, isn't what it? Do you yeah, think I about mean, that? so this often occurs in the Vajrayana tradition, in the Tantric tradition, and a lot of that comes and in from, Hindu traditions too. Yeah, yeah, and and in in like old Tantra comes from Pashupata tradition, or like a the, like the tantric practices where they originated from are quite like full on. It's only after hundreds of years that they assimilated them into a kind of like um, family friendly practices, you know, and then that evolved and that kind of merged with Buddhism and then went to Tibet and where it flourished into Vajrayana. So there's, there's a whole evolution of what Tantra is as well. And the behavior it, when hmm, so complex, but I would say that the there's a whole tradition of Mahasiddha, right? So these are guys who um, have seen the nature of reality very, very deeply, have seen the disillusion of all illusion, um, have seen it, experienced it within themselves, and as a result of seeing it so clearly, um, those psychological hindrances no longer arise. So like a real bodhisattva so there is interestingly when you get to a certain stage of insight this is this is all kind of documented in um when you go it, sri lankan theravadan uh, monks the abbot normally writes a kind of meditation manual the abbot would be very experienced in meditation and this would be for the monks so when you reach a certain stage of insight um when you see the disillusion of the self when the body starts to dissolve the mind starts to dissolve you 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 overcome fear and I, uh, and I, those thoughts of nihilism and you become to or you arrive in the middle path where you see the nature of reality dissolving into nothing but arising again then if you've made a decision i suppose or a vow to help people teach people the path you can't go any further in your meditation practice um, because you'll is, just be too checked out to yeah. inter, want to interact with people. Yeah, there needs to be an element that's still here of this earth so you can connect. But what happens to people when they have walked that path, when they've made their intention as a teacher or a bodhisattva, um, they become endowed with certain siddhi, the ability to see into other people's minds or hearts. And if someone very skilled in that is able to, um, see the hindrances working through someone's psychology and they're able to skillfully say something that can just chop it away or or, or dissolve it or um you know but that comes through real deep insight you know there's there's no games or manipulation going on that comes through genuine insight into someone's psychology it's born through um uh, deep practice of insight i and in Vajrayana, this would be the case. The Mahasiddhas have reached or attained that position. However, what you maybe what we have is a lot of people who haven't necessarily attained that insight and perform those behaviors, um, but are maybe doing more harm than good. Yeah. I mean, a broad question would be um, how do students evaluate a teacher? Because many times, you know, a teacher will seem impressive, as you say, they might have they might be charismatic, they might be eloquent, they might be a sort of a Shakti field around them where you feel something in their presence. And then on top of all that, um, there's 
some strange behavior that's going on either secretly or publicly and a lot of times students will sit there and think well this seems a bit off but hey he's supposed to be enlightened and i don't think i am and so i guess i'll just stay and sit here and you know and then sometimes these groups just go farther and farther off the rails um and you know because the teacher is going off the rails and the students just follow along so i just i just wonder about how to um empower students with greater discernment and tell them you know to give them greater confidence to you know vote with their feet and leave if uh, if the situation warrants it or stay if they genuinely conclude that the the teacher is has their best interest in mind and is not you know ethically um compromised yeah that's such i mean god that's so important isn't it there's so many um you hear so many um Guru. all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's dangerous isn't it i just think god there's so many things i mean in the tradition like you wouldn't you would you're you wouldn't take on a guru and, and at least for like nine years after uh, you know watching that person closely for nine right. years nor would he you take know? you on i mean there's this sort right. of mutual checking out process yeah. yeah yeah it's not it's not you, you know and 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 it wouldn't be for money either it would be purely for the 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 love of um freedom you know and liberation i think if there's if there's a lot of cash involved i'm a bit wary <laughs> um but yeah i mean how do you how do you tell psychologically i suppose you can never tell where someone is at if they're more advanced a practitioner than you are you don't have that insight to see beyond your where you're at where one is at um so it's always hard to say isn't it but i mean I quite that's why I like about the Theravadan tradition is because they don't have that guru lineage. Everyone is a friend. You know, you might have the most advanced practitioner in the room, um, but he's a or she is a friend, and that's how they. It's like a kind of a, a linear. Nice. Yeah, to peer really kind love of thing. That. Yeah, yeah, like you know, we're, what was that expression? We're all holding each other. We're, we're walking each other home, isn't it? Right, right. right. Yeah, I, I love that attitude. But the guru, um, interestingly, though, if that person. Uh, has a lot of faith, has a lot of um, heart for the path, that in and of itself will transform the individual. So whether the guru is a, is a real or a fake, it doesn't really matter. The faith itself can yeah. do that. In That's other words, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, so the student's devotion will carry them along, even if the teacher's kind of half-baked. Um, but I, but I mean, but ultimately, you probably like, know the story of Eklavya in the Mahabharata, and and who was um, his guru, his archery guru was also Arjuna's archery guru. You know that whole story. It's it's, it's a great story. Ah, huh. oh, I don't know it. Oh well, anyway, um, Arjuna had made his teacher, whose name Drovia, Dr I forget the teacher's name, promise him that he would be the best archer, the best bow bowman. And um, but this guy at Calavia came along and he's he started getting really good and better than Arjuna. And Arjuna said, Hey, you, you promised me this guy wouldn't get better than me. So uh, well, actually, so the teacher sent him away. So okay, I'm not going to teach this guy anymore. So the guy goes away and he he builds a statue of the teacher and just worships the statue and practices art practices his archery. And then he keeps getting better. And then so this gets back to Arjuna. And he says to the teacher, you got to do something about this guy keeps getting better than me. <laughs> and, uh, and so the teacher goes to him and said, Oh, if you're really devoted to me, cut off your thumb and give it to me. Mm. So he did, and that was the end of the story. But he, he couldn't practice archery anymore. So I know it's kind of a sick, sad ending, but um, <laughs> but it shows that just through devotion to a statue, in this case, he was able to continue to advance. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a huge, uh, it's a massive um, motivator for the path. I think it's a really wholesome motivator that faith or, or that love. The devotion to to the path but yeah i mean like back back to you know what you were saying about how how can you tell if a guru is the real deal or how ultimately i just think you know just in the way that any human relationship should for uh, a healthy human relationship um you need to watch out for any red flags of manipulation or um psychological torture i don't think we should feel weak uh, we should feel empowered. A guru should empower us, but also help you honestly reflect on how you're behaving as well. But I think you can do that with 
a, in a loving relationship. I, I don't think you have to be you abusive. Sh- <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And like you say, f- faith and devotion, that's, that's what's so sad is sometimes people are just so innocent and even, even kind of naive and full of faith and devotion. And then teacher betrays them in some way or turns out to be a scoundrel in some way. And people have literally committed suicide because they were so disillusioned um, or at least, you know, wandered, you know, left the spiritual path because, you know, to heck with it. If this, if this is what it results in. So anyway, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it, it's a little bee that I have in my bonnet, you know, and yeah, it's I, part of the motivation for starting that group, the organization, the uh, no, it's spir- important. spiritual integrity. Yeah. It's really important. You mentioned money a minute ago about how it shouldn't be about money. And it's interesting because in the old days, I mean, you, a lot of the spiritual aspirants were in ashrams or monasteries and the laity helped to fund that. And that was the setup. And these days we don't have too much of that. And we're in a modern society where you need money. So that's a whole nother issue, which has practical and ethical implications, you know, um, about paying for spiritual instruction. And some people, some people feel that nobody should be charging and some, (laughs) I don't know, there's all these issues around it. It's interesting. I've thought about it a lot, you know, like what, how, how, cause we need to live, don't we? We need to pay our bills. We need to, we, we, we can't, unless you go and live in a, in the woods off grid, you know, totally self-sustainable, which is completely possible. Um, we still need to deal with money. Um, I was really fascinated by kind of studying the historical Buddha, like how did he work with money? And um, it's really interesting. Like he was a canny businessman, you know, he, he, he was, yeah and he knew how to sweet talk all the bankers and the kings but what what was and dharma got to finance the expansion of his teaching yeah yeah to build stupas to build meditation halls none of it went into his pocket he didn't care for the material wealth himself well exactly (laughs) yeah he had nothing he didn't need anything um so yeah i think that's i i you know skillful ways to bring money in for the benefit of others just in the same way a charity works for the benefit of others but as long as that's wholesome and nobody's kind of like scrimping away for their own okay we need our basic needs met of course we need um we need uh food to eat and everything but i suppose it comes to a point where um how much is excessive yeah just covering our basics is enough if you don't you know if you're beyond needing materiality then <laughs> right and is the teacher you know, working the students to death, <laughs> you know, in, in his, his or her ashram or teaching yeah. setup, and then, you know, living high off the hog themselves and, you know, having their own, you know, I don't know, just I, there have been situations like that where teachers are living really cushy lives and mm-hmm. the students are doing unpaid hard labor for, you know, many <laughs> hours a day. How um, do they get away with it? It's amazing. I don't it? know. It's just one of those <laughs> like, things. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. And, you know, uh, as we talk along, if any thoughts come to your mind that you'd like to talk about that I'm not asking you questions about, um, feel free to just interject them because I don't want to. Sure. Yeah. I want to make sure we cover everything you want to cover. Um, so we talked a little bit about the different stages. We don't need to elaborate on too much and stream enter, once return and non return. But I guess the point is there are there is a kind of a, a sequence of awakening stages or experiences that on what we might call a gradual path. Mm-hmm. And you know, you um you use the word upaya here, which means skillful means. So perhaps we could contemplate that a bit and contrast it with um my friend Raymond Schumann sent in a question about um, the neo advaitins these days, who who seem to offer instant realization in their talks, um, and who who actually criticize any notion of a gradual path, you know, because hey, ultimately you were already enlightened, right? And so how can you gradually attain something that you already are? And um, you know, and practices only reinforce the notion of a practicer and, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. s- things yeah. like that, that they say, and the world is an illusion and you have no free will and, and on and on. Um, so how do you contrast this notion of a 
gradual path with direct realization well you know i think certainly do people do have um non-dual experiences where they're able to see into the nature of reality and those people yeah they they have a such a huge satori or a huge awakening experience that lasts for a long time that they are permanently in that state like yeah i absolutely do believe that you can have that and i don't know if they may be worked hard lifetime after lifetime and this one is just like you know here we go um so i think it's possible i think it happens however i think maybe lots of people kind of um like okay so for within the vajrayana texts within the mahayana tradition there's a lot of expounding of the tathagata the thasgon the um the, the 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 idea that this we are already enlightened a lot of these poems or stories are written from the perspective of a fully blown bodhisattva so when you look at the uh, like so there's a text a famous text called the the diamond sutra when you so what it says in the text you're not a bodhisattva until you have seen the nature of dharmas until you have seen um you've gone through the stratospheres of your own psychology down to the very 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 core of what it is that makes you tick of what um your the root of your desire and aversion is and if you've seen that arise from nothing and pass away into nothing once you've passed through the stages of um terror aversion fear from complete annihilation and you've come out the other side then you're a bodhisattva then you can say that yeah you're a tathagata you've uh, you're in that state permanently um but i so i i've thought about this a lot and i've wondered why what what is this um where does this come from you know um this view and i wonder if it's because a lot of the texts would talk from the perspective of an enlightened person that's one possible reason um so you know people are kind of going along with these texts or this teacher says this you know uh, from the perspective of, of an enlightened position and then other people are thinking oh that's how it is yet haven't gone through those necessary stages yeah i think that's really important it's the the description the the a description is taken as a prescription right and, and it's like yeah. a guy standing on a mountaintop shouting out the what he what what the view is from the mountaintop right it's, it's not necessarily helpful to the people who still need to climb the mountain right yes yes exactly and i think that there's a whole bunch of practices i mean god can you imagine like wouldn't it be a shame if you thought that your whole life and you got to the end and you're like oh shit i was supposed to practice <laughs> you know like yeah. like i just you i just think I can't speak from for anyone else and I can't speak for the truth of how it is but I can only speak from my experience and my experience is that the practices have have relieved suffering the practices have taken me to places and shown me things um that I never would have seen had I not practiced um they have um permanently got rid of certain psychological hindrances which psychotherapy did not you know so for me the path really works and for me i want to be free of suffering i want to be um i, I want to be compassionate i want to be full of love i don't want my own ego kind of fighting at me as i walk through life i, I want to be free from that that's so so the practices um do work away at your psychology they do work and i just think that it's a shame if if we never get to experience that thinking we're enlightened i could say the same um you'd be amazed to, to see what condition i was in when i was 18 <laughs> and uh you know how starting a regular practice changed me i was i was a mess i mean you know drugs and ar arrested and dropped out of school and all this stuff and just you know regular practice turned my life around so nicely um so i'm kind of an advocate of it but, and i just want to point out that a minute ago when you were talking about the tathagata having gone through all this sort of deeper probing um you're not just talking about intellectual process of understanding things more deeply you're talking about an experiential process as well yeah there's a very fascinating um so when you're so especially particularly through insight this is this was how the buddha um came to his realization 
was through insight. He'd mastered all the samadhi practices, the, the techniques of concentration, um, which were very yogic, which come from um, yogic traditions in India. But he, he noticed, okay, well, when I come out of samadhi, I'm still suffering. So I've still got those psychological things that are going on in me. So he found another technique, which was to look at a method into the subconscious. It's like your mind has stratospheres. And this is through sensate experience. So it's really fascinating. If you concentrate enough on sensation, just in one small part, you start to analyze your concentration gets stronger and deeper. You start to analyze the, um, the way sensation moves the way that phenomenological experience moves through your body through the flesh you know as sensation and your mind gets more laser beam in its concentration you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into your subconscious and interestingly like all your stuff just starts to arise in your body and you can see that the all the connection of all your suffering but you're sitting there with an equanimous mind watching this um, your your stuff arise as you get deeper and as you look at that more closely. So it manifests maybe initially as pain around the body. Like I don't know, you ever had you know when you get a really good massage and it's like um and it feels it's painful but it feels good. It's like oh yeah that's good pain. So it's like that because you're in an equanimous state. You're not getting involved in the uh, the the psychological suffering or that like like oh it hurts. But well, you're trying not to anyway. And the experience of that rising to the surface and passing away, you're watching it so closely and you're seeing how it changes all the time. And the more you analyze it, the more you can break it down into tiny components or parts. And you see that these parts are just like tiny, tiny building blocks that just arise out of nothing and pass away into nothing. So the whole body is just like this um, arising and passing away of just little tiny molecules constantly. And that's, um, that's transformative that you're like, oh, my personality isn't even real. Like, none of this, this isn't even real. These are just parts put together as like Lego, like, or, you know, none of this. Yeah. And so that attack, you kind of on a, atta- detach yourself. No, uh, detach is, is the wrong word. It all loosens up. Yeah. It all kind of, um, separates a bit more. There's no tightness anymore. There's no. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and there's a good physiological, there's a good explanation for it, which is that the mind and body are interrelated. So if the mind gets into a deep, settled state, you know, um, yoga chitta vritti naroda, the, the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind, then the body follows along and gets nice and deep and rested. And the body has a natural tendency to want to rid itself of accumulated traumas and stresses and so on. And so it'll naturally go to work doing that. And then you'll experience some pain or some this or some that. I remember I was on a two month, two and a half month meditation retreat one time, and I ended up having this really severe pain in my shoulder. And I hadn't done anything to injure it, but the pain was just there. I'd, I'd mainly feel it during meditation, and and I'd, I wasn't kind of analyzing it into molecules, but just to sort of allowing myself to feel it, not distracting myself from it. And over time, it finally just dissolved. And then there was a feeling of, ah, oh, you know, some, mm. some, something I had been carrying, whatever yeah. it was, why ever I had it, it was gone. Yeah, right. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying. It's like, you know, when someone says, oh, just let go. It's like, well, yeah, I would if I could. I don't know how to, yeah, you know, that body, psychological you thing. Know, it, it grips yeah. the stuff, yeah. Well, if it's in your mind and it's going over and over it, you can't just let go. Like, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe you can. But this thing, I think through practice, you you that's the process. But also, interestingly, I've found through practice, it well, it's not necessarily the So with concentration practices, like, so you're, it's an an action. I'm concentrating. My mind wanders. I bring it back, keep doing that over and over again. Eventually it stays there for a while. But interestingly, the non-dual experience just arises spontaneously and naturally after the practice. Like when you're just minding your own business and going about your day, because you've been training yourself to steady your mind and keep it there still so it's not getting drawn into sensory experiences the mind is just steady and then naturally that non-dual state just arises without effort effortlessly so for me i think the practice is really really important for that non-dual state to emerge you need to kind of create the container for that to arise and then everything dissolves from that 
so it's like you're creating more and more subtle containers until that, that non-dual state and i just think yeah some people can do it without the practice but i can't i mean these <laughs> the, these people are amazing if they if they if that's you know they can do it here and now that's and, oh, and maintain uh, it <laughs> just, a, just, just a week ago i was contacted by an 18 year old girl in toronto i think uh, montreal who um gave me the most beautiful one of the most beautiful descriptions of functioning in awake in an awakened state that i've ever read and but she didn't quite know what was going on and and you know i got i talked to her for a while later and uh turned out her, you know she was basically born in a family of yogis her parents and her aunts and uncles and all these people have been on a spiritual path and uh she obviously is just a very highly evolved soul it came in and she's just awakening naturally um and uh, without practice without practice wow yeah yeah i mean yeah, she, she, you know those verses in the gita where krishna talks about picking up where you left off if you've done yeah, a lot of spiritual yeah. practice and you don't yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's the thing you know what would they call them uh Prachika buddhas they don't like the shravaka buddhas who kind of practice the word of the buddha and you know do do the path uh from the canon from the pali canon and there's ones that are just naturally no like they just go crack on and not yeah 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 i mean that I, I i believe i think that's the thing that is certainly a thing i mean it's very hard to make absolutes in this topic i, I don't think we can because experience is so diverse and so um individual that that the, the range of experiences the range of kind of how to get there how to walk up the mountain is just so diverse i mean let's let's switch the, the conversation to um Kundalini we have uh, we should spend a whole hour on that um and maybe and a couple of questions have, have come in about it which I'll ask soon maybe we should start by having you define it even though everyone's heard the word but it would be good to have a definition yeah okay um I suppose mm, in a nutshell <laughs> it's a process by which the an unfolding takes place in the human being that breaks down the um, compactness of the human being so that uh, one's consciousness can connect to a greater consciousness. Compactness, what, how does it, what, is, what do you mean by compactness and how does it break it down? So, um, <clears throat> okay, so the idea that, okay, so let's try to imagine this, the self, just like a vehicle, I mean, the classic kind of analogy of um, car, like, you know, wheels, engine, wheel, um, bonnet, all of those parts aren't the car, but when you put them together, we become the car. So we go about life thinking that we're just this whole thing, whereas in fact, we're a bunch of separate components working together to function as a human being. The we get so attached to this um, collection of processes that work together that we forget that we're just a bunch of parts that come together. And as a result, you know, that becomes very tamasic. You become very kind of solid and believe that everything is real. So we live in this illusory. This is the idea. This is the um, sense of being asleep. There's so much tamas in the mind that we go about life thinking that everything is real, thinking your identity is real. Kundalini is a bit like the, um, in its raw human form, it's like a force, um, a, a power that brings the universe into creation that kind of erupts from within yourself and it breaks each part of yourself down so that you start to experience yourself as more than just one compact thing but you are in fact connected and a collection of various things and you start to see that or oh, you start to see the layers of yourself kind of unfold and yeah and the, i suppose the experience should i talk about the experience yeah please yeah so the experience manifests in many different ways the classic kundalini i suppose starts off with a heat erupting in the belly and sometimes spiraling or it can pulse out like an electricity or an energy from the belly button area or the heart um and then a um fire 
It can be blue, can be red, can be like a flamethrower, can be like a subtle energy moves up the spine. It can stop at the neck and burst out like light from the sides of the neck towards the head, or it can just shoot straight out the top. Sometimes it's so subtle and delicate that one can hardly feel it. Sometimes it's so intense that the whole body feels like it's up in flames. Um, th that's the classic version. And as there are so many other um, experiences that happen as a result. So ultimately, it's a bit like pouring liquid fire through your subtle system and clearing out any blockages that one might have through the subtle body like the the, the nadis. Um, there's a lot of if we are to really geek out on this, there's a lot of like, so scripture would say Kundalini is solar energy and it moves through the body. Some might say that Kundalini is a sort of prana. Um, some might say Kundalini is uh, prana is in like uh, um, life force vitality. Um, there's a lot of kind of discrepancies in the text when you kind of really get into it. I mean, as well, this kind of the, the word came about probably around uh, the Tantric era, around 300 AD. And it's been changing and evolving ever since as Tantra has changed and evolved. So, um, yeah. That's and some, some attribute intelligence to Kundalini and actually refer to it in the feminine gender, you know, as, yeah. a, as a goddess of some sort who is intelligently working out our evolution by you know yeah. putting us through the fires of purification or something yeah yeah so so within within the the tantric um philosophy <clears throat> our, our whole universe is a, a structured symphony of sound everything is a a, a vibration every uh, stratosphere of our consciousness maps or maps onto the universe in that structure as well there is a, a form and a structure to it um and it's all vibratory it's all sound based so each uh the way the universe is organized through these stratospheres of vibrations we um our consciousness is is also that way so kundalini is it's a, a, a primordial sound that breaks through all of those other sounds and brings one into atonement you could say um but yes, these goddesses, these deities are a kind of personification of each vibration. So these vibrations would be a kind of, um, and, and these goddesses would be like an energy signature, you could say, for each of these vibratory components that make up our whole universe. So when you're going through Kundalini experiences, it is also common to feel like you're being possessed by a deity. Um, and to feel like something is taking over you it's called a, a bhavana like a, an attitude of that deity will, will just kind of flood your whole being and that could be devotion or fierceness or um um poise and intellect it, it's it manifests in different as different states of consciousness yeah when i first started experiencing it back in about 1970 after a long meditation course so yeah there were several strange symptoms. One was I, I, my face would go into these strange involuntary grimaces and I, I knew what was happening basically. And so I didn't, it didn't scare me and I didn't resist it and I didn't do it in public. I would just sit quietly and let it kind of work its way out. And, and then also there was a lot of this sort of head shaking business. And I, I was driving an ice cream truck at the time and whenever I settled down, my, my head would start to shake. And so I, I would, you know, sometimes come to a stoplight and my, my head would start to shake because I was just sitting there without. While she were driving. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, it That's passed. So it, it cleared itself yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the kriyas, yeah, the, 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 right. the, that can be a thing, right? Where the, the spontaneous kriyas, the body will start moving. And that's where the mudras come from. Initially, it kind of looks like jerky movements. But then after a while, refinement, they, they start to become very um, stylized. In the tradition, in, in tantric tradition, there's a practice called nyasa, um, where you, um, it, it's a kind of ritual installation of the bija. The bija is, the, is, a, is a written signature of the deity. So you're kind of installing the deity onto the body. In tantra, the body is the universe. So you're kind of activating all these different parts of the um, 
kind of as a vibratory experience of the universe. So yeah, like so when you're experiencing those kriyas, that's kind of um, eventually that does end up into into those mudras. Yeah, around the body. Yeah, or, or a clearing out. Yeah, that's it's really funny. I remember <laughs> just being at the pub with a friend, and she just started writhing on the floor. She was going through it at the moment. And I was like, oh, should I? Should we go or like? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I suppose yeah. they happen whenever they uh, want to. Yeah, I, I could tell you stories. I mean, just big groups. You you could tell them too. I'm sure. Just big groups of people meditating together and stuff, and everybody's like, it's some kind of like a epileptics convention or something. <laughs> people people all just go to <laughs> flipping out and writhing around and making weird that's noises great. and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. I love that, you know, and that's how, and that's the attitude. It's it is funny, and it's okay. That's the thing. I think I think it does actually um, freak some people out. As it, of course, especially if you don't know what it is, and it just starts yeah. happening, which happens to people sometimes. They, oh my God, what's happening to me? They right. run to the doctor. The doctor doesn't know what's happening, and sure. next thing you know, they're on Thorazine or something. Right. Yeah. And and that's the thing, is it? And I understand that sometimes I think it can get quite, you know, vigorous and relentless and continuous. And that is, you know, disturbing for people, especially I think, you know, if you've got a certain um, maybe um, religious, um, how would you say, conditioning, maybe you might you might connect that to a certain maybe negative thing as well. And that can cause confusion or someone can tell you that it's a negative thing and then that can that can bring on a lot of anxiety. Yeah, you might think it's it, the, the demons coming after you or something like that. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's um yeah, it's a natural, natural process. I mean, like, you know, you look at you look at nature and you see animals who experience a traumatic event, they shake. Like, right, you know, right. just that's their natural response. It's we don't do that. We don't shake. We just tend to store things in and kind of get more angry and bitter as we get older. So yeah, it's kind of um it's really necessary, isn't it? Yeah, I remember in The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle talks about how, you know, some ducks he was watching had a little fight and then yeah. and then they stopped having the fight and then they just kind of shook themselves off and then they're over it. They're just yeah. swimming around again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to get back to that nature, don't yeah. we? Or at least get rid of any like sort of um, stigma around certain behavior, you know, in pol polite society, one should behave a certain way. I mean, yeah, I get, I, I you know, certain social boundaries are helpful and good to create harmony and, and, uh, you know, yeah. Harmonious interactions with everyone. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's the thing, isn't it? Just being able to go somewhere safe where you can just let all of that unravel, where you can be somewhere without any judgmental eyes, where you can just, um, not hinder that process. I think the more we let ourselves let go to it, then the easier it is. Yeah, I remember on the first course I took with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was my teacher back then, uh, I remember him saying, well, I want to put you into really long meditation programs, but they have to be in a secluded place so the public won't hear the screams. No. <laughs> 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 wow, a proper catharsis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was yeah, that good? Did it help? Did you feel good afterwards? Oh yeah, yeah. So you got got it out of your system. Yeah. Um, so here, there's a couple of questions. This is from someone named Sarah Page in Ascot in the UK. I had a Kundalini rising experience during a hot yoga class where I felt the life force rising, and as it reached the fifth and sixth chakra, which would be neck and forehead. Um, the shaking started and continued for a couple of minutes, culminating in the urge to stretch my tongue far out, and then it all settled again. Mm -hmm. Does this indicate release of blockage in the in those chakras? Uh, uh, shaking was it around that? Well, I suppose she's, was this an online question? Yeah, this if it's is around a, that area. Yeah, then, yeah, definitely. Or maybe the shaking was all over, but she felt the uh, energy Particularly when reach, it reaching these areas. Yeah, and then. Uh, and I and then she was wondering like how can she get it up to the seventh chakra? But I, I that brings in a point. You can finish answering this other question, but also add to it um, perhaps an advisory against trying to force Kundalini in any way. Um, I, I mean, I don't, as opposed yeah. to letting it naturally rise. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. I mean, as far as the, it could, okay, so this is speculation. I don't think it, like, unless you've got like actual insight, you can see subtle bodies and you can actually, you're there witnessing. Um, I would never say this is actually what's happening, but I, my, my guess, based on what I understand, when Kundalini reaches certain areas and that aspect of your being maybe has um, things to resolve, then that can echo through the whole body, you know, so when that movement of energy reaches some kind of resistance, that's the shaking that happens. And uh, yes, that shake or that resistance, it might be speech, maybe that speech or resistance of speech or oppression of speech might have affected one to such a degree that it, it echoed through the whole body you know in terms of how maybe that person was oppressed or, or or abused or whatever um then yeah the shaking will release all of that and it does move through the whole body i've never assigned a particular uh um part to a thing however i mean this is definitely apparent when you in in a certain vipassana practices or mindfulness practices you can go in and you start to feel vibrations or blockages unraveling and when you step out of equanimity and you go into thought you can see what those psychological things were so yeah they're usually related um it's, it's very difficult to kind of say precisely what what psychological processes meets particular chakras we must remember the chakra thing is a western model initiated by Jungian theory. This isn't- Oh, really? Talk about- it, it doesn't have a historical um, source in- The, 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 the emotional centers. Um, so, so Walter Woodruff uh, brought these ideas over, who was uh, Arthur Avalon, who brought these ideas in Tantra over to the West with his um, book on Kundalini, on um, Shakti, on Tantra. And he was the, he was like this, um, Bengali judge. Oh, sorry, he was he was English, but he worked in Bengal. He worked with Bengali scholars. He was a judge in India in the uh, I can't remember when. I have to find that out. But he um, so yeah, I mean, his he was so scientific about tantra. When he brought that back, the the West were amazed and adopted it. It's from a, one particular text. That's why the six chakra system is so popular in the West. It's from this particular lineage. This particular. Um, pathway but the the he wrote about the glandular system being connected to the chakras um and assumed then an emotional position on each chakra so in um in tantra the chakras represent a certain as as tattva, which is would be a layer of consciousness um yeah a vibratory part of consciousness a layer a, a projection of of a um, vibration of a particular sound vibration which brings together certain aspects of our universe um so not in, but i suppose i suppose you know i can definitely see how there's no mention of emotional states within that no, i wasn't thinking of that too much but um i mean you know sometimes you hear okay uh, when the heart chakra opens then you you're going to experience a lot of love and when the throat chakra yeah, opens you may yeah. become more eloquent and when the Agnya chakra opens in the, in the middle of the forehead, you might gain deep intuitive insight. And then when the seventh chakra opens, thousand petal lotus, then, yeah. then that, that's enlightenment. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. is that kind of explanation there in the ancient text or is this some kind of modern? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's certainly, yes, 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 exactly. Yes. I suppose you know, what you're saying, um, I, I've definitely seen that before. Um, uh, in regards to the psychological processes that happen as each chakra opens. Um, and yeah, they do govern certain functions of the person. Um, absolutely, like the fact, uh, the capacity for compassion, the capacity for empathy, the capacity for um, uh, forgiveness, all of those things would be heart chakra related things. Yes, yes, absolutely. I've, I've definitely seen that. I mean, more from, ex so interestingly, when you look at the text, they don't necessarily talk about those things, but the commentaries on the text will talk about those things. Here's another question. This is from Rahul Ag Agarwal in Chandigarh, India. Would Anne suggest how to keep active Kundalini energy manageable in awakened people with weak neural network or with a, a history of trauma? How far can people like me progress? I mean, 
so a weak neural network does that mean i, I guess he's saying trauma? he has uh, like, he, i think he maybe he's saying he has a history of trauma which has weakened his neural network and um he wants to keep kundalini energy manageable maybe he's implying that it's sometimes unmanageable uh, and he feels like maybe because of his trauma and everything he his progress might have its limits and uh, mm -hmm. I, he, yeah <laughs> i mean i think that we limit we tend to limit ourselves as human beings and our own psychology does that um this is why so i love the buddhist part the kundalini is mapped out in the buddhist path there is a part of the process where kundalini is situated it's called in the the arising and passing stage of insights where all the kundalini stuff happens in a structured path in a structured path of meditation um so there's preliminary practices before you awaken kundalini so we need to um kind of calm down the fight or flight centers in the brain before we start working on the subtle layers of our nervous system because we're going to be bringing up trauma which might often is fear-based and so if we have learned to control the fight or flight parts of our brain through practices of loving kindness self-compassion um uh cultivating a really good strong moral foundation in behavior um doing all of these things which are going to create calm ripples in your world then kundalini is much easier to manage there's not too many blockages to come up against so i think the work really lies in uh, making getting yourself into a safe place first in relationships in your house situation in your um, work situation your actual life um, where you feel safe you know get away from those toxic relationships and then start cultivate because the mind is plastic isn't it we can we can cultivate different attitudes so cultivating firstly care for yourself and then care for others so this was how they would lay it out in the buddhist path you know so we've got a really good um healthy ego before we start digging deep and pulling out the skeletons from the closet i think that's probably wise um but as for healing which maybe i'm wondering does is this do you think that this is where the question is referring to as well I, he'd have I, to he'd have to tell us more but um i just inferred from the question that he yeah. has has a history of trauma and is wondering how it might impede yeah. his his development yeah uh well i mean I, I definitely think always work on the trauma always get yourself safe get yourself um to a position where the fight or flight where the, where adrenaline isn't pumping through your system all the time i think that kundalini can um if it's happening spontaneously then there's no choice it's going to take you on that ride and it'll iron out those creases anyway yeah so that's good i mean you you're sort of espousing a, a slow and steady wins the race approach or we could say a safety first approach and well, yeah know, i think the ego can get really damaged like i've seen people kind of get really gung-ho in it and get and 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 these extraordinary explosions happen within the body within the self like really full-on experiences that just mind shattering but um they they've entered into delusions of grandeur or um uh, like a really unsteady sense of self and um haven't been able to manage reality like keep their jobs or keep their um family or do, do you know what i mean and it, it's oh yeah I mean, sure, we can abandon all of that and just go right, like, you know, straight for the <laughs> top of the mountain. Well, you know, who am I to say one shouldn't? Um, I just think there are consequences in. Yeah. In, you know, well, if you actually want to reach the top of the mountain and not fall off uh, right. in the process yeah. of climbing, I mean, mm. a lot of spiritual traditions um, place great emphasis on purification and, uh, you know, becoming a sort of a well integrated person like you say with a healthy ego and and you know moral foundation and all that um for years you might be mm -hmm. apprenticing like that in a, in a tradition um swami sarva sarva talks about how that was in balurmat in in the, in the ramakrishna tradition and you know some kind of young aspirants come in there all gung-ho and they just want to meditate 18 hours a day and no you have to work you have to do this and and all and maybe 
10 years later, you you could get on a routine like that. But, you know, it, we're impatient in our modern Western culture. And a, a lot of people think that they can just take a, a heavy psilocybin trip or something or ayahuasca journey um, and awaken Kundalini. But the system can be full of impurities and, and full of um, hidden gremlins that are just going to come out and bite us if we haven't, you know, pr- work them out in a more um yeah progressive and I, way and i think it's really important to just accept that that's okay as well that we are full of gremlins <laughs> that <we> have, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's really normal growing up in the world where we bump up against each other where we've you, you know traumas really no i would suppose you know there's deep trauma and there's kind of just standard trauma but um yeah yeah it's like that that stuff is is okay as well it's interestingly you know i I, initially i kind of got all i suppose i felt a really strong uh, motivation initially really really strong motivation initially like i was on a war path not not a war path as in a bad way like fighting or anything but just determination like such strong determination and um and uh i remember like my attention and will being kind of forged by this um, yeah I remember patanjali in the yoga sutras he says vehement intensity those with vehement right, yeah. intensity they're going to get yeah. it yeah <laughs> yeah totally totally and and you know what there's so many distractions on the path that it's kind of hard to, to do practice long enough and deep enough to to really shift your consciousness in a way that does make permanent change and we do need that like vigor and that that um passion and ardent um devotion to the to to practice otherwise you know the old yoga class a week isn't really going to do anything i think i think it's you know we we often say oh temper temper go go easy go slow but we we need some vigor we need some of that passion to keep us moving forwards to keep us driving through some of these really icky like attachments that distract you like your phone or like nonsense on media and you know it's, but you have constant... to pace yourself you know yeah i mean there's that famous there's that yes. popular saying this is a marathon not a sprint and right, you know, if, right, if you try right, to right. run a marathon and you're you're going full out sprinting you're you're gonna go like you know a couple hundred yards and have to <laughs> slow down you and that's probably very wise yes and yeah. i think yeah and yeah you could probably say maybe i was a bit of a teenager on the path in that sense yeah, you know I, definitely i've been there <laughs> like, come on <laughs> let's go yeah 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 no for sure for sure and i think um i mean for me at the time i didn't have dependents uh i didn't have a child and there's no no one i mean obviously other than my parents and friends but i was happy to fully let go of yeah. everything so at the time it was but now I, i'm a mother and uh that's my duty that's my my primary concern and and i need to keep my stuff together you know for for my my child so that's yeah so i wouldn't do anything to jeopardize my sanity <laughs> no or <laughs> your child right, go make your right. own dinner kid i'm, I'm not finished I'm with meditating. my four-hour yeah, yeah. meditation <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um so closely related we haven't necessarily finished the kundalini topic and we can dip into it more but we can sort of intersperse it with um some of the psychological challenges that um mm. accompany it and accompany the spiritual path in general and you sent some helpful notes on that. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, points about impurities of insight and stages of insight, dark night of the soul, this got, distinction between psychosis and awakening, and you know whether you know a, a spiritual aspiration can actually trigger psychosis, or uh, you know the difference between uh, you, you mentioned the phrase meditation sickness and and so on so it'd be real interesting to talk about some of these things in mm. whatever order you want to yeah yeah them. no but that, that that's it's just it's such a fascinating thing that's coming up quite a lot i mean since mindful based practices started becoming really popular yeah um and and were prescribed as a means for psychological wellness for people what they were finding is that some people were getting really into the practice that they were starting to go through the 16 stages of insight so these are very um uh, deep insights that happen um in, through vipassana and as you move through these insights you're faced with you ever you, so within hindu philosophy they talk about mara you know the the illusion like it's a demon like it's come to 
feast on like it's yeah, trying to throw Buddha off his game just before. Right. Was, right. Yeah. 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 So all of these, uh, you know, as you're going, as you're in, making progress on this path, you meet fear like full on. You know, as you're as like not just like existential terror you know or, or um but it's a necessary part of the path to overcome to to understand what are those what is exact what exactly is fear what what is it you know and break it down and that's a really important part of the path as well to let go of this thing to understand it to and then to really let go of it properly let go of it the same thing with um you know anxiety or doubt or um hate or aversion those things as well they come up really strong so that the practitioner can examine it and understand the nature of it in an insight way like in a um a deep meditative way rather than just experiencing it psychologically in your day-to-day -day life so that you can really let go of it and then become a um you're no longer a worldling that's what they refer to it as like you become like that's when you start to enter into the realm of arahant you know that so people are touching on these experiences when they do their mindful based programs but they've you know it's obviously terrifying it's obviously um quite scary so so that's why the the path to enlightenment is quite different from what we would see as just get someone better because they're psychologically suffering there's um so i suppose what we need to understand is bring the whole path over or look at the whole path um rather than just a bit of mindfulness based practices to get better we're looking at the preliminary practices as well to secure that you know like healthy ego um I go with a bit of track there what well what so in my own experience on uh, you know over the decades uh, and being around groups of people doing spiritual practice and all now in, for the last decade interviewing all these people um i've seen many examples of spiritual practice resulting in some kind of i mean resulting in beautiful things in terms of you know so many nice things but also in some cases resulting in mental breakdowns and um or becoming extremely odd or eccentric or or idiosyncratic um and i've gone through some phases myself you know which i mentioned earlier i got kind of kooky on long meditation programs without enough integration and stabilization um and you know i live in a town where hunt you know a couple of several thousand people have been meditating for many decades and i see some people around town who have just become so strange in in their older age um really eccentric um fanatical off balance and yet they've been meditating regularly so um so there's the, the immediate thing of maybe having a psychotic episode on a long meditation course. And then there's the, the long range thing of how do we maintain integration and psychological health um, over the, the course of our lifetime so that spiritual development becomes a, a blossoming of all positive qualities and our full potential rather than something which leads us into um, I don't know. It's yeah. a, a strange mental state. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really, really important to to discuss this, I think. And it it's um so in the tradition, when you're going through the 16 stages of insight, or when so the there would be a kind of the abbot or the head monk of a monastery, and you would be in communication with that teacher explaining your your where you're at. The teacher would be able to recognize ah they're at that part of the insight process okay so i really need to make sure they're doing this this and this practice or really keep an eye on them really encourage them in this particular kind of way so they have this um what's called um 10 impurities of insight that's one of the names that happens so especially when you get really deep in the practice or especially during a rising and passing stage you get like uh, a lot of kundalini experiences you start to glow or you have psychic experiences or the, the well i mean you know it's very in otherworldly experiences and um typically because we're human we start to go oh wow that's great i want more and uh or that's amazing i'm i'm 
Jesus or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, aren't, you know, I gay, that, aren't I cool now? I should. Right, uh... right. And and that's okay. That's really normal. That's just what humans do because suddenly you've just had a mind bending experience, <laughs> you know, initially. And then the the so the what they advise is just okay when that stuff does start happening you just got to keep your mind equanimous so they call it the uh, 10 impurities of insight because commonly people start to get very attached to those delicious experiences and that will kind of pervert the psychology and it will start taking the person away from the path to developing and cultivating a kind of um, a buddha type heart um, so you're saying that different impurities of insight could occur at different uh, different ones of these 16 stages? Uh, yeah, but typically, typically when you, I mean, very typically in the initial stages of getting into deep meditation, when you start having the Kundalini experiences, I mean, mm -hmm. some of the things that you like are like real deep insight into scripture or um, understanding the path more or um sort of psychic experiences or visions um the that's important on one level as you embark deeper on the path but then um i mean those particular things usually happen at the initial stages the initial stages of insight i mean it doesn't always happen in a linear order that's the thing um the impurities don't arise if you're keeping your mind just observing so okay what you would do in that situation if you started getting things of like pride come up whilst you were having a kundalini experience like oh aren't i special then you would so there they advise or oh, just note pride just be like oh pride's coming or you know so until it passes or just just be really honest and note what psychological um thing is arising as 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 you're observing yourself having the experience there's always a commentary happening um same late at any stage in the past what the dangers are is um really feeding attachment or aversion to to the processes that happen and i think gosh in terms of i know some of the quirky or kooky behaviors i, I don't know in terms of if they last a long time no, I mean, it seems like they do from what I can observe. Do, um, I mean, I know people who are just who've been kooky for years and they they, they still meditate, but boy, they uh, you go into the local grocery store and they'll kind of come up to you and start ranting and raving about some conspiracy theory or something or other, oh, you know, okay. whatever, just off balance. Um, and then you, you know, yeah. have examples of famous gurus who arguably we're at a very high level of development they certainly seem to make an, an impact a huge impact on people who were doing really weird stuff behind the scenes you know sexual misbehaviors yeah, 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 and yeah. things like that so you'd, you'd think that okay that must be an impurity of insight at a at a high level yeah 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 i mean both you know hindu and buddhist i mean there have been many cases of buddhist teachers in the west crashing and yeah. burning you know yeah sure oh god yeah yeah i've heard some horrific stories yeah yeah, yeah i mean i i wonder as well this is i mean th this is the the genius this is why i like um these traditions is because we've had they've had over two thousand years of cultivating refining um developing these um paths and uh preliminary practices or uh, methods to prevent these things from happening you know like people for thousands of years have been intensely meditating and wandering off the path and exploring different uh, psychoses that come up as a result of certain practices. And so, so the tradition is that various traditions, whatever they may teach, whether it's the yoga sutras, the Theravada path or the tantric path, it's really important to look at the whole path because in that will be buffers or protections that will help you when you veer off um or prepare you to go deep you know all of these things these are these have been carefully cultivated over thousands of years you know of trial and error <laughs> and i i just think that that there's something in that, that longevity you know and watching people come out the other side well not me personally but reading phenomenological research into um arahants or their experience of becoming an arahant is very interesting in terms of how they've been guided through that to prevent these psychological processes. I think when you embark on it alone, it's 
it's hard that's why it's so important to have a sangha friends not necessarily a guru but um friends where you can share knowledge with each other and help each other out reflect you know when when if, when we're behaving weirdly and your mates can just go oi <laughs> you know stop it yeah so in your case you mentioned you didn't ever really have a teacher but i guess have you had sanghas or you know yeah, spiritual yeah. friends that you oh of, yeah totally yeah. like my, my favorite thing to do is go on like long walks in the woods with 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 fellow buddhist mates and chat about dharma that's yeah yeah <laughs> like you know um but uh yeah yeah definitely throughout the years in all kinds of situations through sort of hedonism through practice through um um you know, different traditions through you know yeah friends have been very important in that but also did you say hedonism you went as in hedonism you, yeah you, like kind you of went through um, a hedonistic phase <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure like yeah 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 well you know when i was younger yeah yeah um, i guess we all did <laughs> most of yeah, us yeah sort of <laughs> yeah yeah you get that out of your system i suppose don't you yeah. um but yeah i suppose that's the thing isn't it the uh the the attachment to to worldly pleasures that's yeah. that's always going to like i have this debate with some friends a lot here because you know they're, they're not interested in the the path to enlightenment uh they're interested in different different aspects of spiritual development and uh i often have a con this conversation with friends about well i don't want to uh stop doing all the fun things i don't want to stop enjoying um the things that make me laugh and have joy with my friends you know they, they don't want to and that's and that's absolutely fair enough um and i think what i'm trying to what i'm trying to understand about this path is i don't think we have to stop having pleasure uh the issues arise when we start getting attached to the pleasure yeah um also the, the buddha taught that. the middle way right i mean he didn't say you know be an aesthetic and uh and in hinduism there's a similar thing um you know about just sort of balance and and not not being a hedonist and totally indulging and also not necessarily depriving yourself of, of experiences but you know putting first priority on being established in being and uh and then performing action and having action actually become more skillful by virtue of your establishment in being yeah 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 absolutely yeah i, I completely agree i think it's um yeah, I mean, I, I know people who became monks and um, threw their robes in because they had strong desires arise, um, you know, and felt that the desire was kind of getting twisted yeah. because it needed an outlet. Right. You know, it had that, that, that hadn't run its course properly to fully renounce. And I think this is the, the sort of healthy thing to do, you know, when in, in uh, the, the, yogis in india um they the, to enter into brahmacharya abstinence you have to kind of sow all your wild oats first and then once you've got that out the way then you become brahmacharya so that's um it's unhealthy to become brahmacharya so abstinent um unless you do that we guess. well yes i think the way they outline it is you know up until the age of 25 be a student be a brahmachari then if you're inclined to do so get married and go through the whole thing of sowing wild oats and having children and so on and then when you get to you know retirement age you go back into a more recluse life but then you know people like shankara say you could bypass the the whole householder phase if you're cut out for it and um, just yeah. go straight from the brahmachari phase to becoming a, a sannyasi uh but if you're not cut out for it that wouldn't be advisable and um there's a gita verse which says because one can perform it One's, one's own dharma, though lesser in merit, is better than the dharma of another. Better is mm -hmm. death in one's own dharma, the dharma of another brings danger. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, it's like, in a way, we, we, can, we can be very adamant and diligent and enthusiastic about our, our spiritual progress, but you have to find your balance point beyond which you're going to actually sabotage your your own progress by pushing too hard and being 
not being who you naturally are, you know, being too unnatural. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, isn't it? It's kind of like tempering as you go, kind of really being honest with yourself. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't think it should. Oh God, it's it's so difficult to um, to make any absolute statements about such uh, a, a complex a complex thing. It, it's very much different. right, right. Yes, it, it's it's always um, you know we can like you say we can deprive ourselves of things that we really need to nourish <laughs> you know to know to bring joy or love um togetherness or community into our lives it's 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 really those things are really important that kind of healthy connection to humans yeah. i think that's that's super important um <laughs> i'm laughing because i'm remembering some of the crazy things i did i, I don't want to oh. talk about myself too much <laughs> But just you know like extreme fasting and then gorging myself afterwards you know right. because uh, <laughs> things like that um yeah yeah you gotta try it all yeah. <laughs> why not i mean well okay maybe that's not not a sensible thing to say to, <laughs> to people but i mean i yeah i i i feel like um i feel like the spiritual path you know can is quite extreme for those who are um deeply devoted it's you don't have a choice you know it takes over your whole mind and your whole life like that's just what you do and who you are like you know and you can go about pretending that you're like i'm a normal person but no that thing consumes you all the time like once that once you that spark has been lit yeah you know <laughs> So let's let's loop back around a little bit. So we've talked about Kundalini awakenings. We've talked about um, you know s the fact that they can sometimes be scary or uncomfortable, um, and we've talked about the you know the possibility of psychosis or instability or dark night of the soul and, and all that. And you talked about how these traditions have safeguards to kind of keep you on track as you go along. And I was going to comment when you said that that. Um, it seems like these safeguards are not applied as often as they should be. Like there's some kind of lack of oversight or diligence in many cases, um, perhaps because some teachers just don't have anyone keeping tabs on them. You know, they're the top dog and nobody calls them on their stuff. But um, big picture, you know, what, what would you say about this whole consideration of safety on the path in order not not to slow it down but to actually make it you know fructify as as quickly and assuredly as possible and um, perhaps what could be done you think in contemporary spirituality to have more of that you know to have it be less of a messy scene and more of a, a wholesome yeah uh, productive yeah. one um okay so i can only speak on behalf of myself and where i feel like i'm at in my path and that it's is um i've started to realign um myself or cultivate right intention focus on cultivating right intention more so like i go i'd have i'd have the idea i could go sit and meditate um but behind that is an intention you know behind that is an intention maybe i want to get enlightened maybe i want to polish my ego maybe i want to do, do you know what i mean all those intentions so i've really been trying to notice what's my intention to go and sit and meditate and i've really been trying to cultivate the to do it for the benefit of others so if there is a compassionate motivation then then act on it because that will amplify that motivation so cultivating bodhicitta um i think that yeah, whether you have little of it or abundance of it, I think it's really important to cultivate it, to, to, to let that grow, to, to feed it as much as possible, to let that be your kind of, um, um, your navigator, you know, even if it's sparse initially, like just, just go on that. So if there's an, if there is, if there is a kind of a, a feeling to go and help someone go and do it, like, you know, that's, that kind of loving kindness path that stuff is the most wholesome most safest most beneficial for everyone else like so who cares if everyone gets in like what about the people who are still burning on the boat or suffering you, you know this is this is the thing there's a big whole movement in self-improvement and um becoming amazing and um hacking 
the psychology, all of this stuff. And I think what we forget to do is cultivate selfless intention. Um, that I think is, is the, the safest, most beautiful um, way to safeguard against, and you're protected. I mean, can't prove this, but there's psychologically and spiritually, there's a protection somehow that happens when that is the motivation. That's a really good answer. I, and I wouldn't have anticipated that answer, but I, 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 I totally get it. And, um, you know, I mean, if it's sort of like enlightenment or bust and it's for me, uh, you, you, we've seen examples of people who become kind of spiritually selfish and, um, to heck with everybody else, my program, my meditation, my diet, my this, my that. Uh, and the, you, you end up with kind of a spiritualized ego or something. Um, but if, if it's more in the, in the theme of St. Francis, you know, um, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Um, let me sow compassion. Let me show sow kindness, love, et cetera. Um, then I don't know that it, it, it seems like that would be, protective in the sense that it would prevent self-aggrandizement it would prevent egotism which pride goeth before a fall you know so it would help to prevent falls it's really mm -hmm. good really good perspective mm -hmm. good answer yeah i mean i think that you know that point of death um that's that's what gets evaluated uh, you mean how, how, how oneself, one's yeah. own reflection process. If one has the clarity of mind at that point, yeah. Um, what were your intentions more than the actions? Yeah. Some people say that who have near-death experiences that they they come back from the near-death experience saying that they were it was made clear to them that the most important thing in life was how much they loved, mm -hmm. you know, not certainly not how much money they made or. Right. You know, yeah. How, how much they meditated or anything else. Yeah. And that's and therein lies the joy. Like that naturally just that generates joy, like those yeah. behaviors, those attitudes. Well, that might be a good note to end on. Um, is there anything else that you know you feel is important that we haven't covered? So much. <laughs> Tons of stuff, yeah. <laughs> it was so lovely to speak to you. Um yeah, no, I think it's uh yeah. Yeah, it's a great thing that you do here, create this platform of different different views and different ideas about such a topic. Yeah, well, I certainly enjoy it and people seem to benefit from it. And um, we were talking before we started the interview and I, I was just saying that I, I try to take a God's eye view of things in the sense that see the big picture. I mean, is an incredibly vast universe we live in. I love astronomy and cosmology and stuff. And, you know, when you consider the number of inhabited planets, there probably are trillions of them in the universe. And in each one, there are probably numerous spiritual traditions and religions. And most of them feel like theirs is the only one or the best one or something. And, you know, try to see it as God sees it. All these things are, are uh, paths up the mountain and uh, people will gravitate to what works for them. And so, you know, you just kind of have to appreciate all the paths and uh, not compare and um, and just, you know, mind one, one's own P's and Q's. There's a, I'll close with a, well, I won't close, but you, you, you can say more if you like, but um, Padmasambhava quote that I like a lot that I've said many times, he said, although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. Mm -hmm. I you like know, that. So just being on your toes and uh, precise. I like and, that. And yeah, that's a that's a good good uh, good summary of of of, of everything. Uh, so you're a mom. You're a school teacher, aren't you? Yeah, part part time, um, and then the rest of my time I study, study and, and write and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and so. Um, you have a website, I'll link to it. And uh, there's some nice uh, articles, a little academic, but interesting and educational and some interesting talks, videos on there that people can listen to. So um, as I did in the past week, so I will link to that. And, um, you know, if you ever write a book or anything, let me know and I'll, I'll put it up on your Batcat page. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> I should get on it then. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a motivation for <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks, Anne. And, thank um, you. Thank you so much for, um, for having me. 
Oh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. And thanks to those who are listening or watching. And uh, we'll see you for the next one.